And what we went out to do is for those 15 users, we said, go to VeriSign, buy your $15 personal certificates. I mean, how's that for a return investment? 15 times $15 versus, you know, a million, a million dollars. That's, that's a pretty good return on investment. Um, and we put the money to good use. So unnecessary complexity is a threat to good security. Again, it, you know, it's obvious when you write it down and state it, isn't it? But if you think about it, we have some very, very complex solutions out there that we're trying to manage and maintain. Firewall rules are the obvious one. I have, I have nine touch, what we call touch points, where ICI touches the internet, and we obviously have firewalls and everything else there. And uh, periodically, we review those firewall rules, and you sort of sit there with this big, huge list of firewall rules and go through them and say, well, that server doesn't exist anymore. I haven't got a clue why that server was put in. And quite often, your only solution to working out why the firewall rule is there is to take it out and watch who screams. So unnecessary complexity is a threat to good security. Security mechanisms must scale. The only way you get things that scale is keep it simple. If it's complex at the start, at the macro level, I can guarantee you it is not going to scale. And to be both simple and scalable, interoperable security building blocks need to be capable of being combined to provide the required security mechanisms. Yeah? This is the bit, interoperable security. You have to have standards to have interoperable security. This is a fundamental, this is, not as, this is not as obvious as the other two when you look at it. Assume context at your peril. How often do we build a solution and we go through all the rigor and checking and analysis and then the business goes and changes it? You build this wonderful solution on the assumption that you'll know, I mean, we did it with PeopleSoft. We put a PeopleSoft solution in. So PeopleSoft version 8, brand new solution. New servers, new hardware, new architecture, went through all the rigor of designing this system to service our human resources folk. And the only access to this was inside ICI, obviously, because you know it's managing people who work inside ICI and HR folk who work inside ICI, so the assumption when they did all the design and building it was that it was only ever going to be internal access. A year after they put it in, guess what they came and said? We now need to do self-service for people at home. So people can sit down with their spouses and their partners and whatever, and they can choose you know, and elect their benefits. So uh, they, can, they can choose how their money's invested on... The, 401ks, what are they called? Four, oh, I got it right, there we are. It's not bad for a Brit, is it? Um, so 401ks and your money's invested and you know you elect your what benefits you want for your children and feed their social security numbers in. And we went, social security numbers? Ooh, over the internet? Ooh. Um, yeah, okay, from home PCs? From all our staff? Yeah, okay. Um, and of course, the model we built and approved and checked and everything else was all about an internally delivered solution. You know, we'd actually sat there with them and said, you're never gonna want to access, access this from outside ICI, are you? <laughs> and they said, no, of course not. So, assume context at your peril. And the problem is, too often, I mean, at, at least in that situation, my security team were heavily involved at all stages of the project, including the redesign to allow home access. And it works really well, and it's secure, and, and my team did a really good job, I'm pleased to say. Um, the issue goes that too often we put a solution in designed for one thing, and then just tweak it, or modify it, or move it to do something else. Or, I don't know, take your HR system and move it from Germany, where of course you're under data protection, into uh, a data center inside Arlington, Texas where you don't have European data protection legislation, which they did on me, um, but that's another story. So problems, limitations, and issues come from a variety of sources. Geographic, we've talked about. Legal, we've talked about. Technical, we've talked about. Acceptability of risk. 
you have to assume context at your peril. And people do things and change things. Ultimately, what you design for one scenario, one environment, may not transfer to the others, but too often people just assume it will. Okay, commandment number four. Here we get into surviving in a hostile world. Devices applications must communicate using open and secure protocols. Again, it's really obvious when you say it, isn't it? What is the default mechanism for logging in to an updating? Well, no, logging in first, logging into a, a brand new Cisco MPLS router. router. Telnet, absolutely. Username, password, all data sent in clear. If you want to update it, TFTP, fantastic, yes. No username, no password, all data sent in clear. Wonderful, isn't it? This is, I shouldn't say this, because Cisco and Jericho Forum members. Um, but I mean, if you want a brain dead, this is supposed to be a technologically advanced running the internet for on, our, on all our behalves. Running the US military, you know, the DOD, they keep on telling us the DOD relies on Cisco powered networks. Talk about brain dead. Yep, and how many people change it? Yep. Yes. Yes. Default secure out the box has to happen. It, is, it really is as simple as that. Devices applications must communicate using open and secure protocols. Yep, I'd agree. And some of them don't exist. You know, anyone, measure, anyone care to name a secure standard for voice over IP? I, IPsec is not a secure standard for, for voice over IP because IP, I, voice over IP, any voice traffic, I'm ex Motorola by the way, um, <laughs> get me onto a hobby horse. But at the end of the day, voice over IP, any voice protocol has to keep the time going so the conversation stays in sync. So the rule on any voice protocol is, if I have a glitch, drop the packet, keep the time synchronization. What's the rule behind IPsec? If I have a glitch, retry, 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 retry until I fail. IPsec is not a good solution for anything. Anything. <laughs> it, might, it might be a great sticking plaster solution, a band-aid solution for you, at the for us at the moment, and we use it. Hey, this, thi this thing's got a Cisco IPsec on it, and that's how I you know, get my secure ID card out, get back into the ICI network. So yeah, sure, we use it. It's not a good solution for lots of reasons, but certainly not for voice over IP. Um, Security through obscurity is a flawed assumption. We all know this, but we keep repeating the same mistakes. Um, secure protocols demand open peer review. I mean, I don't really need to tell this community here, this one, but you'd be surprised how many times and how many times we fall foul of this. You know, another closed protocol, Skype being the obvious one. You know, Skype on the face of it seems to be reasonably secure. There are enough papers around it, including a few from Skype themselves, that you know, actually say this is secure. But the problem is because they won't publish them, there's no peer review. No one can actually say definitively, yes it is or it isn't. They're their own worst enemy in that respect. Although I'm told the Chinese have now reverse engineered Skype. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, the, uh, the answer is it's hard, but if we don't try, we won't get anywhere. And I know that's easy to, for me to stand up here and say, and it's very glib, but it, but it is the reality. Go back to the number, of vendor mem the, the number of members we have sitting on that list, and I would argue that there's a hope that we can shift the market in some aspects. <laughs> yes.
Yes, it's 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 a problem, and yeah, you're right. There is, you know, things like SMTP TLS exists out there, and you you know why aren't, why aren't you using it? Why aren't we using more se more secure standards? And you're absolutely right. And this is the crux of the problem. It takes everybody in this room to walk away and say we are going to use a more secure standard. We're going to force our vendors to provide things that are out the box. I Yeah, but if you don't ask, you're not going to get. And the problem is, you talk to most of the vendors, and most of the vendors I've talked to say, yeah, but no one's asking for it. We accept the status quo too readily. Yep. I totally agree with you. Yes. Yeah, I, think, I, think, well, I mean, we're screaming in agreement here. I, I totally and utterly agree with you. But the problem is, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that as ICI. You're not going to do that from your organization. If we influence people like USDOD, if we influence some of the major companies on there, if we influence the Cisco's of this world, um, dare I say it, the Microsoft's of this world, the default out the box should be secure email, maybe we stand a chance. But if we don't ask, we don't get. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're screaming in agreement here. Um, goes back to the IPsec, encrypting encapsulation should only be used when appropriate and does not solve everything. Um, we'll come on to why in a minute. All devices must be capable of maintaining their security policy on an untrusted network. In other words, I should be able to run, I might not choose to, I'll probably be daft to choose to, but I'm, I should be able to run my entire business with all my devices plugged into the raw internet. Might not work particularly well because, you know, denial of service and packets and storms and all the other stuff going on out there. But at the end of the day, from a security point of view, there is no reason why you shouldn't, in the brave new world, run your entire business connected to the raw internet. Lots of probably business reasons and practical reasons why you wouldn't choose to do that. The main one being quality of service on that network. But you should be able to do it. Trust. Here's a biggie. <laughs> um, there is a need for trust. We all know there's a need for trust. Um, that's why phishing works so effectively, because we haven't got a clue who sends those emails. Um, all people processes technology must have a de declared and transparent levels of trust for any transaction to take place. Ultimately, if I'm transacting with my bank, my bank should be able to verify that it's Paul Simmons who is doing the transaction against his account, and conversely, I should be able to guarantee that it's actually the Nationwide Building Society that I'm logged into. Are the guys from the Nationwide here, actually? I don't think they are actually. Anyway, we've got a couple of guys from Nationwide in the, in the UK here. Um, but anyway, I should be able to guarantee that it's the Nationwide Building Society website that I'm actually logged into, rather than some spoofed website. And again, like the last one, this isn't easy. I'm not here to sell you solutions. I'm not here to give you many solutions today. What I'm, what I'm giving you is a whole bunch of problems that still need solving.